Chapter 46 The song Crazy Crazy Nights became a hit in Britain and we played a European tour in the fall of 1988. At the end of the tour, I stayed behind in London to hang out with the English singer and pin-up girl, Samantha Fox, whom I'd started to see. She and I went to the box office smash musical Phantom of the Opera that I'd heard so much about. I loved the big production shows I'd seen in the States earlier in the decade, and Phantom promised more of the same. As I watched it, though, I could feel it affecting me in a way nothing else ever had. In one climactic scene, Christine, the beautiful singer at the opera house, was alone with the Phantom, a dashing but mysterious musical genius who wore a tuxedo and a white mask over his face. It was a dramatic scene, and when she suddenly ripped off his mask and revealed his hideously disfigured face, I gasped. The drama touched a psychological nerve. The parallels to my own life should have been obvious. The tormented guy who covered himself in a cool disguise but was a shell underneath but I didn't connect the dots at the moment. A thought did occur to me, however, that showed I understood the parallels, at least at a subliminal level. I know I could play that role. Nothing in my background suggested I could do musical theater, but I knew it somehow, and I never forgot it. I could play that role. After the show, Samantha and I went back to my motel. We hadn't slept together yet, but that night she said, Would you like to take a bubble bath with me? Yes. Yes, I would. Back in the States, all was not well inside KISS. Eric had stopped talking to me during the Crazy Nights tour. He sometimes got into ruts and shut down. He seemed mad at me about something, so finally, after months, months, I had to sit him down and read him the riot act. You just can't pull this kind of shit for this amount of time. It might have sounded dictatorial, but the fact was he was there to play drums and be a member of the team. The silence and tension had become unbearable. This non-communicative bullshit stops today, I told him. And it did. It seemed he needed help to force his way out of a self-imposed prison. Things with Eric were definitely getting increasingly weird. But they had always tended to be odd. Whenever we were both in L.A., I would invite him to come over and hang out with me. Is anyone else there, he would ask. If I had people over, I told him, Eric, they're nice people, we're hanging out, come on over, it'll be fun. But if anyone else was there, he refused to come. On the Crazy Nights tour, he had started to obsess over not being the original drummer again. The whole thing was so irrational, what could I say? It was true, he still wasn't the original drummer. He would never be the original drummer. And then there was Jean, despite the poor she bought me as an apology, Jean still hadn't contributed anything of quality to Crazy Nights. More troubling than that was the fact that he didn't seem interested in contributing. And when it came time to cut a few new songs to put on a Greatest Hits compilation, Smashes, Thrashes, and Hits, I was once again left on my own. At that point, I thought, fuck this. Grudgingly, I decided to take center stage. The way things were functioning, Kiss had devolved into my band. I had never wanted it that way, but there we were. It was the reality of the situation. Kiss records were, in essence, solo albums for me. Again, a situation I definitely did not want. But I had no choice. On the cover of Smashes, Thrashes, I was front and center. Fuck it. And in the videos for the new songs, Let's Put the X in Sex and You Make Me Rock Hard, I didn't even hold a guitar. It was unambiguous. I was the front man. Kiss was my band now, whether I liked it or not. Ah, the videos. What can you say about those? To begin with, the songs were horrible. Rock Hard was written by me, Desmond Child, and Diane Warren, a case of three great minds gone terribly wrong. X and Sex wasn't much better. We brought in an extremely talented woman named Rebecca Blake to make the videos. She had been involved with a couple of Prince videos and also put out an interesting book of highly stylized fashion fantasy photographs. We felt we needed a new look, and Rebecca had a vision. She picked the women for the videos and dressed them in everything. When I showed up for the shoot, I said, These women all look like they need a sandwich. They look like underfed pelicans. They had no tits and no ass. And they strutted around as if they were in a Robert Palmer video, hands on hips, icily turning, like runway models, not 80s hair metal video girls. Then there were my outfits. 
I wore a chainmail tank top and white tights while swinging on a trapeze. I danced around in a corset and licked my fingers while a bunch of emaciated women goose-stepped in the background. In the course of those two shoots, I wrote the textbook on what not to do in a music video. I mean, I didn't walk around on the street in tights with bicycle reflectors sewn on them or body glove tank tops cut off just below my nipples. This was a whole new level of bad taste and judgment. Definitely not my finest moment. With the Crazy Nights tour in the rearview mirror and Smash's Thrashes set to take up the slack for a year or so, I had something else in mind, a solo tour. I was fed up with the situation at KISS and needed to flex my muscles a little on my own and cut the cord between me and Gene. A certain complacency had developed in KISS, especially once we had a stable lineup again for a few years. We played everything a million miles an hour. Gene equated that with excitement, but it caused a loss of groove. On the Crazy Nights tour, we'd even had people on the side of the stage playing keyboard sound pads to enhance the rhythm guitar so I could slack off and jump around more and to fortify the background vocals for that big 80s gang vocal sound. Looking back, I can see there was no mystery about why the audience dwindled. My inclination was to put together a band of people I had never played with, just for the sake of doing something different, even though I planned to play a lot of the same songs. After all, Kiss songs were my songs, something I felt even more strongly over the course of the non-makeup albums. Those albums may have said Kiss, but the parts of them people remembered were me. Why shouldn't I play the stuff I wrote? I also figured playing on my own would probably bring something good back to the band. It was a chance to get out from under my frustrations, a chance to play with other people and think about things differently. The only times I'd ever played live with anyone outside of KISS was when I'd recently played in a fun little cover band for a few gigs at the China Club, a New York bar popular with musicians. The combo was put together more or less spontaneously just before the gigs we did, and there was a rotating cast of characters. The only constants were me and a bass player friend of mine named Bob Held. We basically cranked out Zeppelin and ACDC tunes. For my solo tour, I had no illusions of playing arenas. I just wanted a little creative space and the chance to play with different musicians. So I booked a string of club gigs and put together a band. Bob Kulik was my guitar player of choice. Our studio work together over the years gave us some familiarity and gave me full confidence that he could pull it off. Bob brought in the bass player, Dennis St. James, and I turned to a keyboard player named Gary Corbett. He sang, which was important because I needed another voice for harmonies. As for drummers, two names came up as I searched. One was Greg Bissonette, who had played with David Lee Roth, and the other was Eric Singer. Dennis suggested Eric, and I also heard good things about him from other people, so I called him. Eric Singer was recording in New York at the time in a band called Badlands with Jakey e. Lee, who had just left Ozzy's band. The studio they were working in was right around the corner from the office we'd set up to self-manage Kiss. Eric came to the office and gave me some CDs of work he had done in Black Sabbath. He had also done all the demos for the cult's Sonic Temple, and had toured the year before with Gary Moore, the legendary Irish blues guitar player. Eric seemed promising, so I asked him to come to a rehearsal studio and jam with the rest of the band members. It was hard for me to assess him because with drummers it's about more than just keeping the beat. They need to play in front of the beat, on it, or behind it in a way that's sympathetic to everyone else's playing, in this case, mine. But even in that first session, he sounded terrific. The band was assembled and off we went, playing dates on both coasts. I don't think Gene cared about my solo tour at all. If anything, my decision to go out on my own probably made him feel better about what he was doing and not doing. Eric Carr, on the other hand, was forlorn about my doing something outside of KISS. He also seemed hurt that he couldn't play in my solo band, even after I had explained to him that the whole point for me was to do something different on my own. You're the drummer in KISS, I told him. You can't be my backup drummer. It was exciting and liberating to go on stage as myself. One night we played a very crowded gig in Brooklyn at a famous club called L'Amour, and a guy ran up on stage and tried to hug me. All of a sudden there was a huge ball of hair on the stage. The stage invader had ripped out some of my hair extensions. Everybody had hair extensions back then, and when one of mine got pulled out, it looked like a dead rat on the stage. 
When the tour stopped in Manhattan for two gigs at the Ritz, Eric Carr came to one of the shows and sat in the balcony with his head resting on the railing through the entire show. Afterwards, he came backstage and out of left field turned to Eric Singer and said, You're going to replace me. What are you talking about, I said. He's going to replace me in Kiss, said Eric Carr, nodding at Eric Singer. Listen, Eric, you're the drummer in Kiss, and he's the drummer in my solo band. Eric Carr was not a happy camper by the late 80s. He had started to drink more and may have been doing drugs as well, though I wasn't sure. People tended to conceal drug use from me since they knew I was adamantly opposed to it. I don't know whether Eric's increased drinking exacerbated whatever he was going through or whether the drinking was a result of his unhappiness, but he started to get erratic. By the time Kiss reconvened and began to tour our next album, Hot in the Shade, in late 1989, Eric Carr stopped talking to me entirely. Hot in the Shade hatched a hit single, Forever, that allowed us to go out on a major tour again. The video got into heavy rotation on MTV, and we put together a package tour rotating in some young, MTV-friendly bands like Faster Pussycat, Danger Danger, and Winger. One of the bands, Slaughter, had basically started as Vinnie Vincent's backup band after we kicked them out of Kiss. But they too had tired of Vinnie, left him, ditched the name Vinnie Vincent Invasion, and lo and behold, became really successful once they were no longer with him. Their record label kept them and let Vinny go. Funny thing about Forever, because it was somewhat uncharacteristic for Kiss, people pegged it as a Michael Bolton song, since he was co-credited as songwriter. Surely I couldn't have written it. In fact, after an all-too-brief initial writing session at the Sunset Marquee, Michael had so little to do with it that once it became a hit, he asked the Kiss office to fax him over a copy of the lyrics. Only then did he start performing the song in concert and introducing it as a song he wrote for Kiss. When our record label first heard Forever, it was the first time in a decade that an A&R man at our label actually weighed in with an opinion on one of our songs. He sat me down in his office and said I needed to re-edit it so it faded out on the chorus. That was Song Arranging 101, and even though it could be effective in some cases, it wasn't right for that song. The ending was one of the qualities that made Forever unique. This desk expert pushed his opinion relentlessly and with a tone that made it seem like more of a directive than a suggestion. I'd had enough. I was doing this before you were in grade school, I told him. I was at this label before you were here, and I'll be here after you're gone. So thanks, but no thanks. That was the end of the meeting. Forever reached number eight on the Billboard Singles Chart, giving us our first top ten single in more than a decade. Not long after, that record company expert was replaced with the next one. Also at the time of Hot in the Shade, we brought in my therapist, Dr. Jesse Hilson, to run the KISS office and oversee the organization. I signed a formal release saying he was no longer my therapist and would not act further in that capacity. From then on, we rarely spoke about anything but business. Outside of the band, eyebrows were raised about the wisdom and even ethics of my former psychiatrist working for me, given that earlier relationship. I understand that point of view, but when did KISS ever play by the rules? Our very success was built on ignoring the rules, writing our own rules, and sometimes throwing those out, too. Hilson sought out unconventional people to align ourselves with in a business often plagued by inside deals and favors done at the artist's expense. He brought in Bill Randolph, a Wall Street corporate attorney with no experience in entertainment law. For accounting, he again avoided the big specialized New York firms and instead found Aaron Van Dyne, a savvy certified public accountant with an office in New Jersey. Van Dyne had the knowledge and software to calculate the royalties due to songwriters and recording artists, but his lone music clients were Eddie Brigatti and Felix Cavalier of the Rascals. Both Bill and Aaron remain cornerstones of our team to this day, and their maverick approach and fierce dedication have built each of them a well-deserved broad roster of clients. Unfortunately, the same can't be said of Hilson. He left his wife and children around the time he joined the KISS office, and I began to hear talk of his avoiding settlements and child support payments, accusations he vehemently denied to me. 
Eventually, the claims became more public and a case was built against him. I watched as someone who had earlier in my life been a source of stability become increasingly secretive, evasive, and paranoid. It was hard to see this person whom I had known through so many of my personal changes vanish, first figuratively and then literally. Hilson became a fugitive in 1994 and I never saw him again. On July 3, 1990, we did a show in Springfield, Massachusetts, followed by a day off. Since Springfield is fairly close to New York, I decided to go home after the show and spend the off day at my apartment. I hired a car to drive me there. On the highway not far from New York, the driver tried to change lanes and the limo got hit on the passenger side and went into a spin. I wrapped my arms around the seat in front of me and pressed my head into it. We were spinning totally out of control, knocking over lampposts along the side of the road. Then the car slammed head-on into an embankment, and I flew over the front seat and under the dashboard. The car folded around me. Somehow the driver and I managed to wriggle out through the smashed windshield. When a state trooper arrived on the scene, he looked at the car, which was total, turned to me and said, You were in that car? It was the middle of the night. I went home to bed. The next morning, I could barely move. I went to the hospital where they x-rayed my body from head to foot. I was severely banged up, but I refused to stay there for observation and was helped home. We had to cancel the next few shows, yet nobody from the band called me. When I returned to the tour, I woke up every day unable to turn my head or bend down. I still had such bad back spasms that I had to have a physical therapist loosen me up before each show. Even so, Nobody from the band ever asked what had happened. Nobody ever asked how I was feeling. Nobody ever mentioned it at all. I was in a car crash, for God's sakes. You're my bandmates. I couldn't understand it. At the end of the tour, I went straight into a studio in New York to fool around with some demos. Studios are like fortresses or casinos with no windows and no clocks. Real life is shut out. Whatever studio I worked in always became my asylum. It kept me cloistered away from the world. One night alone in the studio, it hit me. It's not that you need to be here. It's that you have no place to go. I had no meaningful relationships, no real connections to the world. Not even within the band that had long served as my de facto family. I had the luxury of being able to go into a studio whenever I wanted. I also had the luxury of going into a studio as an alternative to having nothing else to do. When I got a call about the possibility of producing a band on the West Coast, I quickly booked a flight. When I boarded the plane, I sat down feeling fine, just like any other time I had ever flown. But all of a sudden, my hands started shaking uncontrollably and my lips went numb. I started gasping for air. I couldn't breathe. Am I having a heart attack? I was terrified and had no idea what was happening to me. I jumped up, grabbed my things, and ran off the plane. What just happened? Once I calmed down with the help of a Valium, I went straight to a doctor's office. The doctor told me not to worry. It was just a panic attack. Chapter 47 I always find it interesting when people watching talk shows think the guests on the show are telling the truth. They believe the host and the guest are having an actual conversation like they would in their own home or at a coffee shop. They're performing. Talk show guests always have an agenda and know how they want to come across and what they are selling. That's the case whenever you're in front of the media, whether you're faced with a camera lens or a microphone. When I was in bed with a dozen women being interviewed for the documentary The Decline of Western Civilization Part Two: The Metal Years, it was no different. Once Kiss took off the makeup, I got to be the same guy I was on stage, even without the grease paint. I enjoyed having that line erased, and yet, even though the line had been erased, it wasn't actually me. It may have been a little confusing. Truth be told, I think some women were disappointed that I wasn't like the guy on stage when I was behind closed doors with them. I could perform like that. I could act like that. I could be like that in bed, but it wasn't real. Women were often thrown that they weren't getting what they expected. In some ways, I was much more boring and uptight than they had hoped. The scenario in the decline of Western civilization wasn't totally unrealistic. 
It was having all the women there at one time that was unrealistic. Having that many wasn't, it's just they would be with me over the course of a week. But I wanted to take it to an absurd limit. I created that character, yes, but I also had a sense of humor about it. I'm sure some people thought, what an asshole. But I thought it was funny. I was chuckling along with the viewers. Look at him. I was playing Superman. Still, as I approached my 40th birthday, I began to think I needed to find someone, settle down, and have a family. Playing Superman was well and good, but it seemed like my career, or how I was perceived, was a detriment to finding that person. Sometimes that led to situations where I felt I had to give a disclaimer, as if the life I lived necessitated an apology. I tried to tell some of the women I dated, hey, I'm not really like that, or I'm really a nice guy, or I'm really down to earth. Those things would either prove themselves to be so or not, but I felt the need to explain myself. That was a bad precedent for a relationship. People either got it or they didn't. I thought back to the early 80s in a club I used to go to in New York called Trax. There was always an older guy hanging around there with a telltale hairline. Back then I thought to myself, I never want to be that guy. Now a decade later, I felt I was in danger of becoming that very same guy. I didn't want to be the guy with the comb over still hitting on young chicks. It was ugly, awkward, and embarrassing. I also didn't want to be alone. How was I going to fix this situation? I know, I'll get married. I wasn't shy about telling people about my new goal. I had finally relocated permanently to L.A., and I figured the best way to meet someone was to let everybody know what I was looking for. I put the word out. Soon a guy I knew told me about a woman he knew. As a matter of fact, he had dated her. He said if she gave him the okay, he would pass along her number. She said no, because she had just ended a relationship. That piqued my interest. If something was unavailable, I wanted it. I kept insisting until finally she agreed to let him give me her number. She was an actress named Pam Bowen who had made one-off appearances on shows like MacGyver, Moonlighting, and Cheers and was the spokeswoman character for a big computer company. On our first date, she was late. When we finally got to spend a bit of time together, she told me that she hadn't wanted to meet me because she was having a hard time getting over her European boyfriend, Claude, who had gone back to Europe to marry his other girlfriend. The other girlfriend was pregnant by him and he felt it was his duty. I would later see firsthand that even duty had its limitations. For our second date, I arranged to take her to opening night at the Los Angeles Opera together with Bob Ezrin and his wife Fran. My assistant told me confidentially that Pam said she didn't have anything appropriate to wear. No problem, I said. I arranged a fitting for a rented gown the way celebrities often do for award shows. For some reason, she wanted to meet me at my house rather than have us pick her up. Twenty minutes before the curtain was to go up, Bob, Fran, and I were looking at each other in my driveway, wondering where Pam was and whether we could possibly make the show. Still no Pam. Fran turned to me and said, Is she always like this? I shrugged. Finally, Pam pulled up in her car. I followed her car up the wrong road, she said through sobs and tears. Huh? We all climbed into the limo and the driver managed the impossible getting us downtown in record time just as the theater lights were going down. As Pam and I began to socialize more together, we spent our time with her friends because I had so few of my own. But I didn't think much of her friends. One was Marla Maples, whose claim to fame was breaking up Donald Trump's marriage. Not exactly a pillar of society. But Pam had a very charitable attitude when she spoke of a number of other people I found questionable. They have a good heart, she would say. A what? A transplant? I answered. It's not about how good your heart is, it's about what you do with it during your life. These people were bad based on their actions and life experiences. To me, you can't discount that by saying somebody has a good heart. Even so, I told myself I was in a realistic, normal relationship that could lead to marriage. There was also a lot of drama in the relationship. Right from the start, we constantly sent cards and letters back and forth about being alternatively disappointed or sorry and trying to explain things. The problems definitely went both ways, but I always thought I could fix whatever was wrong with me and with her. 
I want a relationship. I want marriage. I want a family. I want a life out of a Norman Rockwell painting. Then one afternoon in early 1991, Eric Carr called me at home. He had just gotten home from the doctor's office. What's wrong, I said. I spat up some blood, so I thought I'd go get checked out, said Eric. Everything cool? I don't know, he said, but I'm really worried. They gave me some kind of scan and found a finger-shaped growth going in and out of my heart. Did they say anything? They said it could be cancer. Nah, don't worry about it, I said. Everything always seems worse than it really is. There's no reason to think the worst-case scenario is the one that will happen. The chances that it's serious are so small, and even if it's cancer, you'll get it taken care of. Unfortunately, a few days later, he called me again. It really is cancer, Eric told me. Worse still, it was an extremely rare form of cancer. The number of cases of heart cancer every year is in the single digits, but I still thought everything would be okay. He left L.A. for a hospital in New York City, and Gene and I flew out to be with him during his open-heart surgery. As far as I understood it, they took part of his heart out and then reconstructed it with what was left. Not long afterwards, we were asked to record God Gave Rock and Roll to You for the movie Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey, with Bob Ezrin producing, trying to capture some Destroyer-era magic and erase the memory of the Elder. Eric desperately wanted to work on the song, but he was still very frail. You have to pay attention to your health now, I told him, whether that means recuperating on a tropical island or just resting and focusing on yourself. If I knew then what I know now, I never thought this might be his last chance to perform. I would have let him play, but at the time, I was sure he would beat the odds. So Eric Singer played that session, though Eric Carr came to L.A. and sat behind the drums for the video shoot. He had lost all his hair from the cancer treatment and had to wear a massive wig to replicate his natural puffball. He played like a man possessed during the video shoot, duplicating Eric Singer's parts in take after exhausting take. God Gave Rock and Roll to You came out really well, and we decided to try to make another album with Bob Ezrin. When Bob is in top form, he's hard to beat, and I think he wanted to prove something. He, too, was embarrassed about The Elder, and he wanted to buckle down and create a hard-edged, quality album. Hot in the Shade had been a hodgepodge. It was obvious the band was fragmented. If Gene was going to re-engage and we could get back to doing what we did well, I was all for it. We told Eric Carr that we were going to record an album without him. We assured him we would pay all of his bills and keep his insurance going. I reiterated that in the grand scheme of things, the band mattered little. He had to focus on doing whatever he could to get well without compromise. Bob brought in a bunch of drummers to rehearse with us as we started working on Revenge. We played with Ainsley Dunbar for a while, who'd done stints in Journey, Whitesnake, and the Jeff Beck Group, among many others. He was a great classic English drummer, but he just didn't fit. At some point, we brought Eric Singer back. Whether you work in a band or at a factory or in any other kind of job, you have to work together with other people, and that connection affects the overall quality of the work as well as the atmosphere. As fate would have it, Eric Singer fit perfectly. He really was replacing Eric Carr and Kiss, at least for a few months in the recording studio. Throughout it all, I never considered the possibility that Eric Carr might die. I figured he'd be weak for a long time, that the status quo would go on and on. That was how I insulated myself and protected myself against the worst-case scenario. I was wrong. That fall of 1991, as we worked in L.A., I got a call from my friend, Bob Held, in New York. What he was trying to tell me was confusing. Eric Carr had suffered a stroke. The cancer had spread to his brain. He'd been found in his apartment after calling 911. When the emergency responders showed up, Eric was already unconscious, so they paged through his address book and randomly chose someone to call, which turned out to be Bob. But from that moment on, we couldn't get any information. His parents wouldn't talk to me. I called daily to no avail. I didn't understand why nobody would talk to me, or to Jean for that matter. A few weeks later, on November 24, 1991, my assistant called me and said, Eric is dead. I called Jean and told him the news. 
It was shocking, partly because we hadn't been able to get any information about his situation. Gene and I flew to New York for Eric's funeral. It was an open casket funeral, which was ghastly. The body in the casket, which was holding a set of drumsticks, didn't look like Eric. It didn't look like a human being. It looked like a mannequin. Eric's girlfriend, a Playboy playmate he'd been with for several years, briefly took the drumsticks out of the casket for some reason, and Eric's fingers moved as she did. The scent of flowers was overwhelming. You could barely breathe. But I could also smell hostility all around us, people bristling at our presence. Peter and Ace were there. Peter, who everyone knew resented and disliked Eric, tried to tell me that Eric had been calling him all the time. Nothing seemed to make sense. Eric's girlfriend was also filled with anger at me and Jean. It turned out that Eric had painted us as the bad guys. He said we'd booted him out of the band and didn't support him, which simply wasn't true. Everyone there seemed to have the impression that Eric had been cut off, but he hadn't been cut off. Once we told him we were going to record Revenge, he cut himself off from us. I didn't feel like the bad guy, and it was strange to be treated that way. During the service, it was as if a switch had been thrown inside me, and I started sobbing uncontrollably, just bawling my eyes out. In the wake of Eric Carr's death, I continued to spend a lot of time wondering whether I had handled things correctly. Though I thought I had made the best choices at the time, I began to realize I'd been wrong. We had cut Eric off in perhaps the worst way, by denying him what mattered to him most, his place in KISS. That had been lost on me while we continued to do everything we thought was important, everything we thought we could and should do. It was wrong to keep Eric from the thing he loved most, what for him was a lifeline, KISS. And I should have seen that since the band functioned the same way for me and I wasn't even sick. I should have known. Chapter 48 a few months later in January 1992, Pam threw a surprise 40th birthday party for me at the Hollywood Athletic Club. I was caught totally off guard and was thrilled to see a large turnout that included my parents, whom Pam had secretly flown out to L.A. She also hired a Kiss tribute band called Cold Gin to play the party. Cold Gin had started to pack the Troubadour Club doing classic Kiss songs and makeup at a time when tribute bands were not yet a big thing. The guy playing ace in the band was guitarist Tommy Thayer. I knew Tommy a little bit by then and had tried writing with him, too. He played the parts faithfully and knew every lick. I was impressed. He had clearly worked at learning those parts and put pride and persistence into it. It was also fun for me to see a band doing what I no longer did. Tommy told me that he had shifted his professional focus. Aside from the tribute band, he was mostly concentrating on producing and managing bands now. He didn't want to be the oldest guy in a band, still trying to make it, living with a stripper on Franklin Avenue. He didn't want to be the oldest guy in the club, a sentiment I totally understood, and that impressed me. Listening to Cold Gin was also an interesting reminder that Kiss had started out as a classic rock band. That early material sounded more like Humble Pie or The Who than the hair bands. It felt good to have Revenge in the bag, since it was a credible album on which we got back to doing what we did well. Music would always go through changes. We had thought that we weren't current, but that had been a misjudgment. We didn't need to chase trends. We needed to do what we did and do it well. Soon, we had to get ready to tour Revenge. Even though Eric Singer played on the album, we had never made any promises about his touring with us or, after Eric Carr's death, joining the band. Now we had to decide what to do. Gene and Bruce didn't know Eric Singer as a person at all. They had crossed paths with him only for a few hours here and there in the recording studio. But I could vouch for Eric's work ethic and his sense of responsibility as a result of working with him on my solo tour. Eric Singer had been a team guy when it mattered, during the long hours spent touring on the road. The next dilemma sounds silly in retrospect. Eric Singer had dyed blonde hair back then, and Bruce, Gene, and I actually had a meeting to discuss whether we could deal with that. Everybody in the history of the band had had dark hair. Could we have a guy in Kiss with blonde hair? 
Fuck it. We weren't going to make a decision at this point in our lives based on the color of someone's hair. So Eric Singer, as Eric Carr had eerily predicted, became the new drummer in KISS. We rehearsed and played a few club gigs in April to break him in. One thing we quickly learned about Eric was that he also had an amazing voice. Even though he had toured with my solo band, I had no idea. As soon as we started rehearsing the classic material, Eric said, Okay, which vocal parts do you want me to sing? I thought he was joking. Gene sang him a part. Can you sing that? It was too low. So Gene took that part, and Eric tried a higher part. Eric was phenomenal at the high harmonies, and soon we shifted duties around, so he was basically singing all of the high parts, which in Kiss usually carried the main melody. I shifted down to one of the other parts. It was great because it was tough to have to do it all, talk between the songs, sing the lead, and sing the main melodies of the harmonies all night long. Having such a great background vocalist join the band was a godsend. As we got ready to go to Europe for the first leg of the Revenge Tour, I was planning to ask Pam to marry me. And when she became pregnant, I knew this was the time to ask. I bought a beautiful engagement ring. I picked the stone myself and had it set in a band designed to look like a vintage ring she loved. I was very excited when I got it, very excited when I asked her to marry me, and very excited when I went home in June and we prepared for our July wedding. With Pam pregnant and our wedding day fast approaching, we finally went to a meeting with separate counsel to discuss a prenuptial agreement. I had insisted on the meeting because of the vast discrepancy between what we were coming into the marriage with, both monetarily and materially. By this time, I was happily paying virtually all of Pam's bills, but I still wanted to try to come to an agreement at a time when goodwill prevailed. Not five minutes into the meeting, she ran from the room hysterical. I ran after her. When I caught up to her, she told me that we could have the baby without getting married. She said she wanted nothing from me if things didn't work out down the road. Where I'm from, she said, your word is your bond. Overtaken by the fear of losing her completely, I told her I still wanted to get married, without any agreement. A few days before the wedding, Pam miscarried. We were both devastated but went ahead as planned. Everybody at the wedding knew what had happened, and the air of gloom was undeniable. The silence in the face of sadness was all too familiar to me. When Kiss headed out on a full arena tour in October, Pam never seemed to know where I was or whether I had a show that day or a day off. I would call her, and she literally had no clue about where I was and what I was doing. I began to waver back and forth, sometimes wondering what I had gotten myself into, and other times thinking I had to do whatever it took to make it work. I can make anything work. The European guy Pam had just broken up with when I first met her never stopped calling her, and she never stopped talking to him. Early on, Claude called her several times a week from Europe. I asked her why. I mean, I could understand his showing no respect for me or our marriage, but I didn't understand why Pam didn't seem to either especially after I told her that the calls bothered me a lot and asked her to stop. She didn't want to hear it. Making any concessions or adjustments wasn't part of her concept of marriage. She saw anything like that as a loss of her freedom, as limiting her ability to be whomever she wanted, whenever and wherever she wanted. Although it wouldn't cure the core problem, I came up with what I thought was a sobering threat. Why don't I call Claude's wife to see whether she knows you guys talk constantly and see how she feels about it? Pam looked at me with daggers. I was stifling her freedom, she said. The contact didn't stop, I would later learn. It just happened when I wasn't around. I seemed to be back in a disappointingly familiar place, seeking approval or acceptance and not getting it. Pam and I pushed each other's buttons in a way that didn't leave either of us happy. You don't let me be who I am, she would say, so you'll never get to see the real me. We talked about issues like that until we were blue in the face, but I had chosen to be in the relationship. I had seen the signals from the beginning and chose to ignore them or dismiss them. I had no grounds for surprise now. She went to Mexico at some stage to shoot a short-lived TV series called Land's End, and I flew down during a break in the tour. When I got there... I found a message from Claude on her hotel phone. Come on! 
The calls persisted, and my continued requests that Pam stop talking to him were met with more angry refusals. I felt like neither me nor our marriage meant much to her. Actions speak louder than words, and in this case, the actions were speaking loudly. Still, I wouldn't quit. We seemed to be at odds over just about everything, and I almost innately understood that our marriage was doomed. But I didn't want to admit failure. There must be a way to get this right. Chapter 49 Once the revenge tour ended at the end of 1992, Kiss was in for an extended quiet period. The music industry landscape was changing dramatically, both because of grunge and because of a general downturn in the economy. On the professional front, we spent the next two years on a couple of homegrown projects. Gene came up with the idea of a photo-heavy coffee table book on the band called Kistory, which Jesse Hilson brilliantly suggested we create, print, and market ourselves. Gene also had the idea for a series of Kiss conventions. For both projects, we turned to Tommy Thayer. Tommy was from Portland, Oregon. His family owned office supply stores, and his father was a retired brigadier general. Tommy was bright and diligent, and despite tasting a little success with his first band, Black and Blue, he had moved on, cut his hair, and started working on the sidelines of the business. Tommy also loved Kiss. When work began on Kistory, Tommy started the months-long process of going through boxes and boxes of photos and clips in our archives. Not surprisingly, he bore down on the material. He had an encyclopedic knowledge of Kiss, and in a pre-internet era, when every bit of minutia wasn't readily available, his brain was a unique and genuine resource for a project like we had in mind. Eventually, when the photo editing was done, Tommy moved to Gene's guest house where a computer had been set up to produce the book. Jesse figured out how to market the book through an 800 number. He figured selling directly would work better than using a traditional publishing company, and his hunch was correct. Once we finished the book and had it printed in Korea, we hired a telemarketing company to take phone orders and ship the books, and it was a huge success. The conventions would be a traveling KISS museum of sorts, where memorabilia collectors and fans would congregate to celebrate the band. Concert promoters had no interest in acts perceived as hair bands, but we figured that, as with the book, we could do it by ourselves, rent ballrooms at hotels, and put on the events without a promoter. Again, we needed someone to handle the logistics, and again, we turned to Tommy, who had proved so knowledgeable and hardworking during the making of Kistory. The conventions were really Gene's baby, and I had very little to do with them. I did help Tommy get custom mannequins from a shop in Burbank and then apply the makeup on their faces. Our original plan was to use normal store mannequins, but they didn't look right. I remember being struck by how different the faces looked after the face paint was applied to them, even though they were all identical mannequin heads. The makeup seemed to change the whole structure of the faces. We also had the four wax heads from the Hollywood Wax Museum. When I looked at mine, I didn't think it looked like me, so I got out some sculpting tools and altered the face. Gene, Tommy, and I started going through boxes at our storage space. We went through crate after crate and cataloged what was in each with the help of a photographer. It was fun to pull out the old outfits and have a look at them again. Day after day, we went through the stuff and slowly decided what to display and how to display it. Tommy and I drove down to a place in Buena Park near Disneyland to a workshop where they built custom-made plexiglass enclosures. We designed a set of collapsible display cases and ordered them. All along, we paid close attention to the budget since we were paying for everything out of pocket and doing it all on our own, with no advances. It was a real education. While the book and conventions were still in the planning phase, we also began to discuss a new album. Bob Ezrin wasn't available, but it didn't matter because Gene had a bee in his bonnet. Music was different now, he said, and we needed to be current. I think maybe he was attracted to the grunge sound because it was dark. It fit with the persona he wanted to project. When I brought in a few songs early in the process, he was very dismissive. You don't know what's going on, he said. You don't know what music is like anymore. I just couldn't picture Kiss writing gloom and doom stories. What are we going to write about, I asked him. 
that our housekeepers didn't show up today, our limo was late. It was ridiculous for me to write gloomy songs, and just as ridiculous for Jean to do it too. It ain't that dark in Beverly Hills. I was also skeptical about what all the grunge bands would do on their second albums. There were a lot of great first albums, but what would they do once they were Platinum Max instead of kids living in roach-infested garages? I mean, if they were so miserable once they had money, they could all go see shrinks. But Gene felt strongly about the project, so I agreed to the plan. He didn't want to do it any other way. I could be proven wrong. Hey, maybe the album would come out and everybody would say it was a work of genius. I seriously doubted it. After all, it was us impersonating other bands, which made no sense. Kiss celebrated life. We sang about how great life was and about self-empowerment. Now we had to mope and sing about how miserable everything was? That wasn't us doing what we do well. I started tuning my guitar down, but I struggled with writing songs I had no real connection to. Meanwhile, Gene reveled in the idea of trying to out Metallica Metallica. There was already a great Metallica, and we sure as hell weren't going to beat them. We were, at our best, a great kiss, and that fact seemed lost as we tried to hop on a train that we could never pull. We'd be lucky to be the caboose. Fortunately, I eventually found a subject I felt connected to. I wrote, I will be there for my new son, Evan. Pam had gotten pregnant again in late 1993, and in June of 1994, we went to the labor and delivery unit at Cedar sinai Hospital. Pam was about a week past due, so we went there with an appointment for her to be induced. She wasn't actually in labor, so I had plenty of time to set up my tripod and camera. I'll never forget the last sonogram before Evan was born. The 3D technology was still pretty new, and when the doctor did a close-up of his head, Evan turned and faced the device as if on cue. Oh my God, that's my face! I'd always thought that having kids someday would be a terrific thing, but until I cut the umbilical cord, I didn't realize the depth of it, the holiness of it, the sacredness of it. Up until that day, life never made much sense to me. You showed up on Earth, spent a little time here, and died. It seemed pointless. But as soon as I held Evan in the delivery room and we made eye contact, I suddenly got it. We don't really die. We were here on Earth to leave the world a better place through our children. And through our children, we lived on. It was stunning to make eye contact with this little person who had just entered the world and to realize that I would continue. This was the cycle that had been going on since the beginning of time. I would live on through him. As we were driving home from the hospital with this new little being in my car, I was absolutely terrified. I probably caused accidents because of how slow I was driving. When babies are born, their necks can't support their heads, and if their heads lean too far one way or the other, they can suffer from lack of blood flow to the brain. I drove five miles an hour, constantly looking in the rearview mirror to make sure his head was upright in the car seat. I had always considered myself the center of my universe. When Evan came along, I suddenly moved aside without even thinking about it. He became the center of my universe, and maybe he was a second chance for me to experience a childhood the way it was supposed to be. His birth calmed me and answered a big question. Why are we here? We're here to raise children and leave something better behind. The profundity of the moment took me back to Hawaii years before, when I had thought I was drowning. Back then, all I could think about was that it made no sense that the world would go on after I died. Looking into my son's eyes, I went from being the center of the universe to being glad to move aside and cede it to him. It's your son. I am here because of those who came before, and I will go on because of those who come after. All of a sudden, I slept better. Chapter 50 The KISS conventions came to fruition in 1995, starting in Australia. Ticket pre-sales were strong, so we weren't anxiously waiting to see whether anyone showed up. The conventions worked because of the mythology of KISS. That was the drawing power. The concept was unique, and people responded and responded in some unique ways. Some people, for instance, got married at the conventions. That might seem odd to some, but I saw it as a huge compliment. 
I never took it lightly that somebody chose to get married and kiss makeup at one of these events. The fact that the band meant that much to people was terrific. To have that kind of impact and to be that much a part of the fabric of somebody's life was a special feeling. I loved the looseness and informality of the format of the conventions, too, with the Q&A sessions we did and our acoustic performances. We were playing to the most hardcore fans and not being scrutinized for perfection. The acoustic shows became sonic snapshots. When we held a convention in Burbank, just outside of L.A., Eric Singer suggested that we invite Peter Chris to come. It was a gesture of goodwill to show Peter that he was part of the family. When he showed up, he was thrilled, grinning ear to ear, punching the air. Peter was older than us, and in the years since he had left the band, the age gap seemed to have increased, perhaps because of his lack of solo success or a dissatisfaction with life in general. I gave him a Kiss motorcycle jacket to wear. The only one we had on hand was about four sizes too big, but he was pleased to be flying the colors. He joined us on stage and sang Hard Luck Woman. He couldn't remember all the words. We hadn't rehearsed, but it was a warm moment. He looked like a kid who had just gotten the keys to the candy store, and I was glad to see him after all the years. We had about 25 stops across the United States with the final convention held at Roseland in Manhattan. Alex and Roger Coletti at MTV, both big KISS fans, had gotten wind of our acoustic shows at the conventions and sought us out in New York to ask us about doing an MTV Unplugged session. In the process of playing all the conventions, we had honed our ability to play the songs acoustically and sing them well. Electric guitars are very forgiving, whereas acoustic instruments have a crispness and a clarity that gives you less leeway. The strings are also a heavier gauge, and bending them is challenging at first. We also sang without any effects, though the spaces often created natural ambience and echo. By the end of the long convention tour, the band sounded great. We felt confident about doing Unplugged. MTV wanted the extra hook of a reunion with the original guys. Peter and Ace were both being represented by an old road manager of ours named George Suet. He came in with lots of ridiculous terms and stipulations. We had to throw all of that out before we could get Peter and Ace into a studio in New York to try rehearsing together. George's terms and demands kept changing, no matter what Peter and Ace had agreed to, but Gene did a great job of riding shotgun and keeping them under control. Everybody had their guard up when Ace and Peter sauntered into the studio. Eric Singer and Bruce were both there, but clearly Peter and Ace were feeling the most uncomfortable. Everybody in the current band was approaching the situation from a place of strength. We never thought for a second about not having Eric and Bruce there. Peter and Ace were coming into our house, and Eric and Bruce were residents. They had earned their places. I had seen Peter and Ace only rarely since the early 1980s. I had heard secondhand stories about how much Peter's playing had deteriorated, how his various bands weren't very good, but there was an exciting and surreal sense of nostalgia in the room when they entered. Tommy Thayer had once revealed a perception of the original lineup that he probably shared with a lot of outsiders. I always thought Ace and Peter were the rock and roll guys, he had said, and you and Gene were the business guys. I had laughed then, and I laughed inside now as they walked into the room. It was true that Ace liked to portray himself as some sort of American Keith Richards, but I knew Tommy was in for a rude awakening. Gene and I had never stopped playing our instruments since the inception of the band. I'd become a much more proficient guitar player after 15 years of working at it constantly. Ace hadn't played nearly as much, and Peter, hardly at all. When they had played, nobody was there to tell them when it wasn't good enough. Peter seemed to have completely lost it. He had become your slightly nutty uncle. He came in with some silly miniature tribal drums that he held in one hand and boinked with a stick. He wanted to hit them while he sang Beth. We nixed that idea. We worked on about four songs with him. The rest of the show would just be me, Gene, Eric, and Bruce. The studio where we did the MTV Unplugged taping was beautifully staged and lit. An audience of die-hard KISS fans packed the place, having heard the rumors of an original lineup reunion. The floor was covered with a huge drop cloth printed with the Rock and Roll Over album cover. 
We had wax figures of us in makeup, swag from the conventions, set up behind us. Ace kept gabbing on and on into the microphone, which was distracting and clearly about trying to reclaim more of the spotlight. That got fixed when the show and album were mixed. When the show was aired in August 1995, it proved to be the second most viewed MTV Unplugged in the history of the show. Almost as soon as it aired, speculation about a full-on reunion started to brew. To me, there seemed to be sufficient good feelings to explore the possibility. In fact, I saw it as a logical next step. Also, given the well-documented car accidents and other brushes with death that Ace and Peter seemed to constantly have, the window for a reunion might shut sooner rather than later, as far as I was concerned. One of these guys was sure to kick the bucket, and if there ever would be a time to get back together, it was now. I also thought a reunion might provide closure. When the band broke apart, we were all young and stupid. Maybe we could get back together having learned from life, and everyone would see the band for the gift it was. Maybe we could see it through to the end and ride off into the sunset together, a band, a team, one for all and all for one, until we called it quits on our own terms. I started trying to get Gene on board. He was skeptical, to say the least, and didn't think it would be the financial juggernaut I was sure it would be. We had just done the conventions and sold tickets for $100 to a pared-down crowd of a few hundred fans in each city. The idea was to get a smaller number of people at a higher ticket price. We weren't trying to sell out arenas. And since we didn't need 15 buses to move the show from place to place, the overheads were lower than a concert tour. In theory, the conventions could have been quite lucrative. As novel and fun as they were, however, they weren't very profitable. Given the way concert guarantees and tour merchandising had evolved, this was the era when concert ticket prices suddenly shot up. It was hard to imagine anything like the conventions competing with the windfall of a reunion tour in makeup. It seemed like a no-brainer to me. Still, Gene was a hard sell. Even as I crunched numbers on the phone for him, his skepticism was unwavering. I was 100% convinced the timing was right. When we went back to L.A., I called Gene and again went over hypothetical numbers based on a possible attendance of 10,000 people, ticket prices, and merchandising statistics for current tours. One example I used was the Eagles. They had reunited in 1994 and continued touring throughout 1995, playing to millions of people and hitting the Billboard charts with a live album. I had personally witnessed the long lines of people waiting to buy t-shirts and merchandise at one of their shows. It was an unprecedented financial success for a band who had also broken up around the time the original KISS lineup started to splinter. Those guys certainly didn't reunite out of a newfound love for one another. And hey, if they could get along... You know how you wet your finger and hold it up to judge the wind? I felt it was now or never. The wind was right. No matter how successful we were in the present without makeup, I knew there was nothing that could compete with what we had been. The myth, the legend, once upon a time. Gene finally agreed to talk with a few talent agencies about the possibility of booking a reunion tour. When we showed up for the meetings, we encountered a perceptible shift in the reception we got. In recent years, we had become accustomed to beer nuts and sodas at meetings. Suddenly, we were ushered into conference rooms packed with bigwigs. Elaborately catered buffets were laid out in front of us. Please, gentlemen, help yourselves. Hot food? Hmm, maybe we really were onto something big. Gene now smelled the coffee. He was in. Part 5, The Highway to Heartache Chapter 51 Based on what booking agencies told us, it was clear that a reunion tour was going to be way bigger than we could handle on our own. We needed a new manager. We immediately thought of Doc McGee. When Bon Jovi went to Europe with us in 1984, Doc was managing them. He took them to superstardom. He had taken Motley Crue to the top, and we had encountered him even earlier when he managed Pat Travers, who opened some shows for us during the original makeup era. If anyone would get it, Doc would. 
We had our first meeting with Doc at a restaurant on Sunset Boulevard in Hollywood. He immediately started riffing. We would do the Seven Wonders of the World tour and kick it off by playing in front of the Sphinx and the Pyramids in Egypt. He thought big, ridiculously big, just like we had, just like Bill Coyne had. Clearly, Doc was the right guy. It was a relief to find somebody who not only got it, but was capable of adding to it, of raising the ante. We didn't take meetings with anyone else. As the planning started, planning started, it became obvious this wasn't going to be one year out of our life, but rather a chunk of our lives, years. Doc was talking about everyone putting all their time and effort into a reunion. Even though Gene was mouthing his enthusiasm, I warned Doc, I've seen this movie. I know how it ends. Doc assured me that he could keep everyone engaged, but I knew the inevitable tr truth. I liked shooting for the moon, but it was also imperative for Doc to understand and accept reality. The adrenaline was flowing, and we were all shooting sparks as we came up with endless ideas. One thing Gene kept bugging Doc about was getting kiss, getting kiss on the covers of on the covers of Time and Newsweek magazines. Apparently, Bruce Springsteen had been on both simultaneously at the time of Born in the USA, and Doc now had marching orders to make it happen for us. Gene said, Doc, the only way you're going to get on the cover of those magazines is if you shoot the president with your makeup on. Doc is one of us. As a reunion became more and more concrete, we had to break the news to Eric Singer and Bruce Kulick. We scheduled the meeting at Gene's house. I don't think those guys thought a reunion was feasible because they had witnessed the witnessed the because they had witnessed the state of state of Peter and Ace's playing during the MTV unplugged rehearsal and taping. I realized later that they expected the meeting to be a game planning session for the release of Carnival of Souls. When we broke the news, they both seemed blindsided. Seemed blindsided. Seemed blindsided. Eric and Bruce were. In Eric and Bruce weren't happy, but we told them we would keep them on the payroll while they took some time to figure out their next next moves. Eric has always been a little cynical and has always seen himself as a hired gun. We didn't mean to hurt those guys, but I still felt bad. They call it the music business for a reason, Eric said, as a way of saying he understood the decision. I appreciate the fact that you guys had the balls to do this face to face. I guess it hadn't always been that way in the course of his career. But that was something important to me. For instance, I would never break up with a girlfriend over the phone, and we had flown out to New York to end things with Bill O'Coin in person. It showed respect for someone, and these guys had made sizable contributions to the band. Bruce, as always, was a real mensch. I get it, he said. A reunion seems obvious. It's the way to go. Not surprisingly, it took a lot of wrangling with Peter and Ace's representative to get a deal in place. Ace insisted on getting more money than Peter because, as Ace put it, Peter wasn't worth as much as he was. Peter hasn't done anything, Ace insisted. He hasn't been playing, and I'm more famous than he is. Of course, this was all behind Peter's back. For all the times Ace threw Peter under the bus, he should have had muscles like a professional bodybuilder. And yet Peter still saw Ace as his teammate and buddy, no matter how many times Ace offered Peter up as a sacrificial lamb. In the past, people had told me, the time to find out that you don't want to be in bed with somebody isn't when your clothes are off. So we spelled everything out in the contracts with those guys, ground rules, consequences for not following them, all the things we would and wouldn't do. And most importantly, we would rehearse and see how everyone responded to working together within carefully spelled out parameters. We left nothing to chance. Part of that included hiring personal trainers, not just for Peter and Ace, but for me and Gene, too. We wanted the band to look the way people remembered us looking. The last thing I wanted was people to be disappointed when they saw a bunch of fat guys in tights. The trainers weren't bodybuilders or anything like that. It was about cardio and basic strength. Even so, the guy working with Peter was aghast, not only at how weak he was and how low his endurance was, but also at how little Peter was willing to work. The trainer said it was like working with an old man. Peter had a tendency to explode at the trainer about nonsense because Peter didn't like working out. Ace, as usual, was just lazy, but he put in his time. 
Alongside the physical training, we also started the rehearsal process, or tried to. We convened in L.A. in March, planning to rehearse for several months. It was imperative to look and sound great for these shows. We were competing not just with our past, but with people's recollections of our past. That was the challenge as I saw it. We had to recreate the impact our shows had on people at a time when nobody else did what we did. By the 90s, everybody had pyrotechnics. Everybody had a show with KISS DNA in it. All it took was money. We had to blow away a new standard. Then Ace asked, why do we need to rehearse? I know these songs like the back of my hand. It quickly became apparent that Ace didn't know the back of his hand very well. And Peter? Peter was another story. There was no point to rehearsing as a band. Peter and Ace didn't know the material, didn't know their parts. I called Tommy Thayer. Tommy knew our music inside out and would make a good coach. We wanted to be true to the original Kiss Alive versions of our classic songs. Listen, Tommy, I told him, we need you to get together with Peter one-on-one -on -one in a rehearsal studio, just you and him, you on guitar, Peter on his drums. You need to go through all the songs with him and make sure he knows what he's doing. After the first day of working one-on-one -on -one with Peter, Tommy called me. Paul, he said, sounding very serious, I don't know exactly how to say this. Uh-oh. I want to see this happen more than anything, for the sake of everyone involved, Tommy continued. But, well, I have to be honest with you. I don't know how you guys are going to be able to do this. He paused. Then I laughed. I assumed he was joking. No, I'm serious, Tommy said. Playing with Peter is like playing with someone who picked up drumsticks for the first time today. It's like he's never played before. He doesn't remember anything, and he can't play. Somehow this didn't surprise me. Not only had Peter failed to grow musically or to hone his craft over the years, he had neglected it. I still hoped Tommy could bring him around. Give it a few more days, I said. You can do it. Tommy kept at it, recording their sessions on cassette and bringing them over to play for me afterwards or playing them to me over the phone. Listening to the tapes was frustrating. At times, Tommy would gently say things like, maybe that last bit wasn't quite right, and Peter would shout at him aggressively, don't you fucking tell me how to play drums. It was a thankless job having to be so diplomatic, having to take Peter's abuse, and for what? So Tommy, a guitar player, could teach Peter, supposedly a professional drummer, how to play his drums as well as a beginner again? In the end, Tommy taught Peter the parts like you would teach a dog a trick. It had nothing to do with music. But lo and behold, after a few weeks, it started to click. Peter had learned his tricks. He could roll over and play strutter. We reconvened as a band. Now we realized Ace wasn't there yet either. I was shocked to see the full extent of the deterioration in these guys, the disrespect they had for their talents and gifts. I called Tommy again, same drill. Tommy and Ace sat face to face in a studio for hours a day, two chairs, two martial amps, reviewing songs. Ace got up to speed much faster than Peter had. Again, we reconvened as a band. Now things started to sound better. We obviously weren't going to get to the level of the previous lineup, or any previous lineup, honestly, but there was now a bit of chemistry. We had a bit of that ragtag feel like we'd had in the early years. Finally, the day came when we went over to Gene's house and put on makeup and outfits together again for the first time, just to see how we looked. It was like time had stood still. We were those guys again. It was magical. I even let myself daydream about the possibility of not having just this moment, but of having a future, picking up where we had left off. When we got down to the business of planning the tour, Doc McGee said, we'll start at Tiger Stadium. Are you nuts, I said. I knew it was going to be a big tour, but I didn't see it at that scale. This was well over the number 10,000 that I had pegged when I had called Gene to try to persuade him to consider a reunion tour. Here Doc was having us open at a venue that held four times that number of people. No testing the water on ticket sales, no warming up. It was chutzpah beyond anything I could muster. Doc clearly knew something we didn't. He was coming off mega tours with Bon Jovi and Motley Crue, and he knew that perception would become reality if people bought into it. Luckily, we deferred to him. 
Soon we had offers from venues we had played at the height of things in the 1970s, and this at a time when many of our contemporaries, bands of the 70s and 80s, seemed on the verge of extinction because of grunge and the sea change in the music industry. Meanwhile, we had huge offers on the table. It was unreal. It was like hitting the lottery again. When the tickets for the reunion tour went on sale, usually early in the morning East Coast time, I would get on the phone with Doc in the pre-dawn darkness of L.A. and monitor what was happening at Ticketmaster in real time. Tiger Stadium sold out in less than an hour. As the other shows went on sale, it was the same. Okay, New York just went on sale. Okay, sold out. Rolling into a second show. Second show sold out. The sun wasn't even up where I was, and we had sold out four shows at Madison Square Garden. Okay, we're into Boston. It was amazing. Doc had been right. 